Welcome to the Serious TV Drama Podcast. I'm Scott, and riding shotgun with me in this Humvee to hell, it's Jamie. Hey, Jamie. Hey. Hey hey there. Glad to be back talking about the boys. The the mental man. Let it commence. (laughs) Yes. We are going to begin our podcast journey covering the fourth season of The Boys, which did debut this past week with a triple play of episodes. So, yeah, we've got a lot to cover, and we don't want to spend 15,000 hours, as we've done in the past, doing it. Because not only that, kids, because once we're done with the boys, we're going to take a little less time about this week and every future week, and we're going to talk about another beloved show here at STBD Studios, and that would be the fourth season of Evil. But that's for later, so for anyone who's tuning in just listen to that, uh, go skip Go check out the chapter selection, and you can skip to the boy. Um, excuse me, skip to evil, or listen to us talk about the boys. It'll be entertaining. We both bring it. At least we used to. Hopefully, we'll do that again tonight. So let's start with the boys. Now, the problem I think a lot of folks are going to have is it's been two years <laughs> since the last season. You know, it's like what is the Sopranos two thousand five or something? So uh, I felt I needed to refresh both myself and everyone listening, what the major plot points that season three left us with. Because, like I said, it's truly been almost two years. So going back to the end of season three, last couple episodes, we had found out that uh, Soldier Boy revealed that he was Homelander's father. Homelander then kills Black Noir because Noir knew about it and never told him. But in that spirit of fatherhood, Homelander reconnects with Ryan and escapes with him when everyone else is fighting Soldier Boy, who is then defeated and taken into government custody, which means we're likely to see him again at some point. Now, Annie, on the other other hand, she essentially gives up being Starlight, and she becomes a full-fledged member of the boys. Butcher, however, finds out that he's terminally ill due to taking several doses of V-24. Now, Bob Singer, that's the character played by Jim Beaver, he's actually running for president, and he ends up selecting Vicki Newman to be his running mate after she has the deep murder her rival. Remember, she's the secret soup that can literally pop people's heads. And finally, speaking of Newman, Homelander and Ryan show up at a rally for her. And when some rowdy dude in the crowd throws basically a plastic bottle at at his son, Homelander, of course, zaps the guy's head off to the bizarre cheering approval of the crowd. Also, I should also mention, while the series Gen V was released in between seasons three and four of The Boys, as of yet, there's only one possibly important plot point from that series to be aware of, which is actually referenced in one scene in the first Boys episode. Which is the fact that there is a there's been the development of a virus that's actually lethal to soups. There is one other thing that's actually sort of kind of a reference to Gen V as well. We either either of us will remember to mention it. We'll see because I didn't. It just occurred to me. I did not make a note of it, so we'll just see if I remember. <laughs> anyway, that's where we were. Let's see where we are now when we dive into the three that just kicked off the season in a big way. The titles of those three episodes were Department of Dirty Tricks, Life Among the Septics, and We'll Keep the Red Flag Flying Here. Now, one of the fun things about watching the the subsequent seasons of The Boys after the first season is they've... Generally speaking, they do a really nice job of introducing new characters into the storylines, be they, you know, regular civilians or the the latest in a slew of wacky, weird soups. And we get both. Um, we, we, we get a first episode, which is jam packed with new characters. And I don't just mean the new and I put that in hand quotes, the new black noir who's actually being played by the old Black Noir, (laughs) except this one. Well, the actual character does appear to have skills, 
but he also seems to be an actor who's questioning his motivation and so on all the time while constantly being told to shut up by the other members of the set. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, for me, while being scolded for talking several times over the past couple episodes, I think the two best moments for this version of Black Noir so far is number one, when he speaks for the very first time, which is after they bash in the brains of those three poor schlubs, including Big Dick Todd. Um, because it's almost a shocking, like, wait, <laughs> did Black Noir just talk? I've been confused about Black Noir being here the whole time, and now he's talking? That's a great little moment. And I think the other one actually comes much earlier when he first when Black Noir first walks into the meeting room of the Seven, and you see that moment on Homelander's face when Noir first walks in and sits down. I, I love it's. I mean, it's not a show known for subtlety necessarily, but I love the subtlety of Homelander. It's just that that slight reaction, and you can read so much into it because, you know. As those of us who've bothered to watch additional material beyond the boys, you know, such as that animated thing, once upon a time, there was actually a very strong bond and connection between Black Noir and Homelander, which is probably why he was so furious that Black Noir didn't tell him the truth. And of course, that means Homelander has to kill you. Yeah, he's got to hold hold your guts in his hand. Yes. There's, there's always a lot of guts being held in people's hands or wherever in this show. So I'll, I'll start the way I look at it. I'll start going through the new characters, and by doing that, that will also open up some of the different storylines that we're that we're going to be seeing. You know, from from minor to subplots to major plots and so on. So, for example, one new person we have is the character Colin Hauser. He's a new man in the life of Frenchie, or maybe. Not so new, because we do later learn that Sergei's guilty conscience is ever present because well, he sort of kind of kind of killed this guy's entire family way back when. Whoops. Um, I do want to say about it that I did laugh out loud, lol, when Kimiko signed to Sergei, You've been spending a lot of time together in the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> That was one of her ways of knowing there was something going on between them. I, I just thought that was very amusing. Um, but the thing with Sergei or Frenchie, um, in the comics, they never really got into anything regarding his um, sexuality beyond him professing his um, love for Kamiko. And that didn't come until um, – I don't want to give anything away, even though I don't think they're going to do it on the series. But let's just say it came – very towards the end of the run of those of their storylines, which I think I did just give it away, but who cares? Um, here, it's I think it's my opinion, and I think I think it's many people's opinion. At the very least, they've alluded to this. I've always I've always gotten the sense like, yeah, I, I would guess at the very least he's bi he's bisexual. So I, I it didn't come as a shock or a surprise yeah, of I, any kind to me. I think there was a whole Broadway production leading to this reveal. Oh, was there? Yeah, I mean, it started triggering some things for me, and I don't remember what episode it was in last season, but it's when they went into the whole uh, trance when they were watching the TV, and there was the whole Broadway. Like scene where right, they did those right. the song the dance number right yeah right and and I, and I guess we could look at it that way because you know it, it's kind of like what they did with Mac and the ballet and, and yep and, it, it really and, yes exactly and in Philadelphia <laughs> I like, I get it I get it I never thought I I never thought I'd make that connection so thank you for reminding me of that. <laughs> oh man oh man oh Shevitz. Um, the, the one unfortunate thing with, with Frenchie, however, is I think the guilt of all this is going is is already setting him sliding down back into his addictions. That you know the whole idea was that he was in Narcotics Anonymous to begin with, and now he's doing stuff again. That can never be good. <laughs> Usually, no. that's a bad thing. No, as a viewer, however, it does lead to some entertaining. Um, battles let's just say yes yes well if, if there's one thing the boys gives us in spades it's 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 entertaining battles so let's move on to the next new character that i was focusing on and that would be firecracker 
Now, this is an entirely original character. There is no previous version of her in the comics. I mean, basically, she seems to be a social media conspiracy pusher with a following. Um, she's a soup with fairly limited powers. There, she's somewhat similar to, for comic book fans out there, she's very similar to Marvel's Jubilee, um, as she can create little explosive sparkles from her hands, and Jubilee did something similar with, with light effects. It's one of those things that seems to be a fairly useless power, unless someone needs help starting a campfire. So she'd be great if she was on Survivor, maybe. That's yeah, I did just for you, Jamie. Uh, <laughs> She does apparently have upgraded strength and durability, which seems to be the case with most soups, I've noticed. But we can tell that because we do see her fight Kamiko. And I believe she's also supposed to have enhanced hearing, though I don't know if we've actually seen that put into action. Um, I noticed when I start flipping through the boys' wiki of different soups, enhanced hearing seems to be mentioned practically for every character or every other character. So that seems to be a very common ability that they have, whether they t let us know it or not. Um, see, I, I think the most interesting thing with her is th the big scene between her and Annie. I, I thought that was something. Um... So it, what I liked about it, one of the things I think the show does well whether it be Homelander or any number of, or or other new characters we haven't gotten to yet, or most of the characters from previous seasons, with maybe one exception. Uh, um, the best TV shows and films and books and whatever media you consume, the best villains are the ones where, if you're spending more than a you know than an hour or two with them, especially, um, you come to understand why they do or why they say, or why they act the way they do. And the thing to remember, and I believe even the creator of the series has talked about this himself, is you have to keep in mind that, generally speaking, the most interesting villains are those who don't perceive themselves as villains. They don't, they don't, as I think, I think Eric Kripke said in one interview, you know, he, he doesn't understand a character who just wakes up like, I'm going to do evil today, you know, which... It's something we'll be talking about later on with that other show. Ha ha. But, uh, <laughs> but with her, when you get the backstory from that scene with Annie, and it's like, oh, that's really interesting. Yeah, I kind of sort of see why she might have a grudge against Annie. <laughs> you know? Yeah, absolutely. And another great thing about that, too, is that not only does it give her, you know, a good character starting point, it's a really good reminder for us to see Annie and where she came from and where she is now right. and how much work it took to become Starlight and then Annie and then maybe Starlight again. But the way we see her as a hero, as one of the boys, that she really does know what it's like to be the bad guy. Right. Not be the angel and perfect all the time. And it's also interesting to get um, different shadings of what she was before because we had been under the impression um, because she was in all those child pageants that a lot of this was her mother's doing. And her mother was a controlling presence. And obviously that was the person responsible for her being become being a soup in the first yes. place. And of course, and we might have had the impression all along that it was kind of like that stage mother kind of thing where she's pushing the kid, whatever. I don't know if we ever took into consideration, like, yeah, but at time, Annie might not have been the, might have been, might not have been a sweet innocent the whole time as evidenced from this. Because it's one thing when we have a firecracker relating what happened, but it's when Annie remembering and even repeating what she said, it was like, ooh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's a really great subtle carryover from Gen V as well, because that's a theme that we saw a lot with these younger soups and having that stage mom, you know, personality um, managing your career or a father who was a soup managing your career and where you have to step in and take ownership for the actions that you're doing yourself. Um, it was great because we never really have gotten to have that in the storyline because, like you said, the show doesn't do subtle usually right. um but there's there's little notes we're starting to see with these characters where um it's it's not all about you know goofy deaths and political fight there's there's real people behind this right 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 so 
let's go to the next and perhaps the most significant uh, new character added, although there's a few more we'll be talking about shortly. And that would be Sage or Sister Sage. Now, there's been some confusion because I, I skimmed over various articles online and some said, oh, th- this character never exists in the comic books. That's not exactly true. Now, the soup, Sister Sage, did not exist in the comics. That's true. Her alter ego, Jessica Bradley, her actual name, she did exist in the comics. She didn't have superpowers or anything that was you know specifically ad- ad- enhanced, but she was an executive assistant at Vought, who worked her way up the corporate chain into a leadership role, and then she eventually gets made the scapegoat for all the problems at the company that she was actually trying to fix. So that was her storyline in the comics. Now, that doesn't, we don't know if they're going to be doing that here, although it is very interesting that at a certain point, she does essentially take over the job that Ashley had. So that, 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 that possibility is there. Because on, on the show, she, you know, it's great to see a young black woman who's the smartest person alive. And any thumping you hear in the background, I don't know if it's coming through. <laughs> that is my two cats chasing after each other. <sighs> okay. So now comic book wise, a character like that, on one hand, you could say the closest comparison that came to my mind would have been the modern day uh, Mr. Terrific from DC Comics, who's often referred to as the third smartest person after Lex Luthor and Bruce Wayne. And that's supposed to be his true ability. But, and the skills his intelligence can unlock. Um, you know, Marvel, I think Reed Richards is supposed to be the smartest one there. Again, I think the creator um, has maybe even commented that there's a certain Lutherness to her. Which makes it interesting since she's working with Homelander, who is obviously the evil version of Superman on this show. So I'm very curious where they can go with that, um, considering she, although she doesn't have actual abilities beyond her um, her intelligence and her regenerative uh, and her apparent regenerative powers, <laughs> because otherwise she'd be, you know, we'll get to that shortly. Um, I, I'm very fascinated to see where they're going to go with that because there's, there's so much, um, we can get where, where we can go with this character. I, I love the fact that initially she wasn't a fan of Leotard, but then, or, or even people for that matter. She's, you know, she was a complete outsider, but we do find out. There they go. Uh, when she was younger, she was a member of Teenage Kicks with A Train, who definitely is not her biggest fan. And but I, I love the reason behind Homelander actually recruiting her. I just heard something very heavy fall in the kitchen, but I'm going to try to ignore it. <laughs> so, <laughs> I I would like to turn around just to take a look at what's happening. So, <laughs> Jamie, if you want to take over talking about her for a moment, <laughs> yeah, sure, no problem. <laughs> you do you you do cat business. Um, I am really out of all of the new characters and in fact, probably out of any of the new characters we've had over the past couple of seasons. uh, Sister Sage is one that I am the most interested in. Uh, Susan Hayward is just one of those actors that kind of steals every scene that she's in. I feel like uh, she sort of demands more attention than anyone else around her. She's just got such a great way that she delivers power through her voice and her facial expressions. So she's always fun to watch. Uh, the character that she's playing in a way is kind of terrifying because even if you don't have the level of superhuman strength that some of the other soups might have, having the intelligence to always Sherlock somebody who walks in the door um, all the way down to, you know, when they if they've been biting their nails or, you know, the cuff of a collar being worn out, seeing all of those things gives you almost having the giving it gives you almost the ability to be like prophetic like you can see what's about to happen a step ahead of time uh which we are seeing her lay out uh in 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 front of homelander and kind of giving him the play out like this is how things are gonna go also i love the idea that it is not just the smartest woman but the smartest person in the world and that she reminds people of that every time that Homelander has the smartest person in the world working with him because he's so sick and tired of people lying to him. 
this there's no way that this is going to go completely smoothly. So it's it's going to be really fun to watch develop. I, I, and actually, um, just to roll that back just a few sentences, and not I wouldn't say to disagree, but just to modify, I think it's less people lying to him specifically. Although obviously, you know, because when people lie to him, he kills them. Um, it's, <laughs> it's more. Oh, I'm going to kill those cats in a second. Um, it's more about the fact that everyone's a sycophant around him. Yeah, it's so the yes, they're all yes, yes men. men. They're all yep. what, and she makes it clear from the get go that's not the way she's going to be. Like, is is he going to be able to accept this? You know, because otherwise they're going to have a problem. And then, and she's not going to. She won't be able. She won't do this. Um, I, I do love the Sherlock routine she, she, she gives him, um, which connects to the whole, um, hey, home, Homelander's finding gray pubes and, and <laughs> which I, I, I love that touch. I, I was curious about why he's keeping them in a jar. <laughs> <laughs> Other than maybe not wanting his DNA to get out anywhere, it seemed to be an odd little thing. But yeah, I, I agree. The, the key thing with her character, and and the more I thought about it, the more I could see why they're kind of referred to in a Luther kind of way. Um, it's for it's for really for a couple of reasons. Number one, kind of like going along with what you were saying, she's someone who's eight moves ahead. That, and that's that's key. So it's it's like you know they're playing checkers. She's playing she's playing three dimensional chess, and she's already seen the possibilities because that's what that intelligence. It's kind of like what you were saying about being prophetic. You you can kind of foresee the issues and how how out fox them. That's number one. That's Luther esque, and her ego is Luther esque. That's the difference between her and say like the Mister Terrific character I'd mentioned, or even Bruce Wayne. Luther's all about letting everybody know how smart he is and how he's the smartest guy, how he thinks he's the smartest guy around. So does she. <laughs> yeah. Is, <laughs> um, yeah. The, the thing I thought was really over, the one, it was cool having three episodes, actually, although it's given us too much to talk about. So we're going to try to dilute them in as much as we can here or reduce them. But, She's a character that I think when we initially meet her and we're getting to know her, I'm like, oh, interesting character. Even though she's, you know, even if she's, you know, quote unquote, uh, aligning herself with Homelander, I think this is someone I might want to like and root for. And then over the course of the few episodes, you realize, oh, hey, you know what? She is as bad, if not worse than, than any of them. And just because she's not the one, you know, punching people's skulls in her her plans and her plots are pretty damn brutal <laughs> you know so that's pretty interesting and then the final thing with her um although we can certainly we'll certainly probably talk about it a bit more than that um and this is only in case anyone didn't catch on to what it was which is conceivable uh, I mentioned that she has, you know, the super intelligence, but she also apparently has regenerative powers, um, which, you know, a, a number of super, like, like Kamiko has regenerative powers, for example. Because when we see that scene where she's kind of just vegging out, watching TV, and the deep sits down next to her, and she says, hey, she talks about how he's pretty, <laughs> or handsome, or whatever, or hot. Next thing you know, they're going at it. And then you see this, bloody instrument that's on the coffee table what she does is she essentially she lobotomizes herself to bring her down to other people's level so she kind of dumbs out a bit but her regenerative powers her brain pretty much comes back and then she's back to me although one can assume especially if they make this a thing moving if they do this multiple times during the course of the season i'm going to suspect that doing that constantly will probably have some net negative effect or impact yeah. on her. Uh, because, you know, how many times can you gouge out part of your brain and just expect it to keep going back, you know, just the same? I, I'm suspecting, you know, we're going to have more than one character with a brain issue <laughs> this season. I love the play on dumbing your intelligence down to be respected and fit in with your peers. Um I, I just I love the play on that, though I'm sure it'll go a lot further than just something as simple as that. I'm sure that there's all sorts of repercussions for her brain getting too large. Um, but I, I do I do like the little the little nod in that that goes along with her character. Yeah, it's 
it, I'm, I'm, I'm waiting for when we first see her do it, which will probably, in, in case anyone didn't pick up on it the first time, I'm sure that they're not going to be able to resist showing her do it in, in one episode, which will probably make everyone go, <laughs> So, um, g- getting back to, again, more new characters being added. We have the fun addition. We get Jeffrey Dean Morgan showing up as the character's name is Joe Kessler. Now, there was a Kessler who did work for the CIA in the comic books. That character's name was Howard Kessler, and he was used and abused consistently and constantly by Butcher for information. In the comics, Kessler was a seedy little putz who had a creepy fetish for female paraplegics and an unfortunate nickname everyone referred to him as, which was Monkey. I know you're thinking, oh, that's a cute name, Monkey. What's what's wrong with that? What could be icky or gross about that? Well, once upon a time, Kessler got raped in both ears by a bunch of green monkeys. So, yeah, that's why. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that'll do it. Now, I'm going to go out on not much of a limb and guess that this Joe Kessler is quite a different cat. As of yet, we don't know much about him, other than he clearly has some shared history with Butcher. He has an awareness of Butcher's medical condition, and he seems fairly determined to either recruit or turn Ryan against his father, and, excuse me, and turn Ryan against his father, or, if worse comes to worse, have him eliminated altogether. Look, I, I'm, I and many like me are pretty much on record of how much we didn't care for the vast bulk of The Walking Dead. Um, but I won't pretend that Jeffrey Dean Morgan wasn't a presence on that show, whether I liked the storylines or not, um, as well as other things I've seen him show up in. Uh, if it wasn't for the fact that there's like 250 goddamn or more episodes of it, one of these days I would actually go and watch all of Supernatural, since a lot of actors and actresses from Supernatural are showing up throughout this and the including him. Um, but I'll live with that. But Jeffrey Dean Morgan's always kind of a presence. I like to see on screen. Absolutely. Uh, I, I, I like him playing off of, um, wow. I just drew a blank on it, on the actor who I like so much. Who's a butcher again. Why am I drawing? Carl Urban. Thank you, Carl Urban. Wow. So embarrassing. Carl Urban, of course. Come on. What's wrong with me? I'm going to get my podcast and license taken away. But I I like them playing off each other. I I, I do hope we get more of him and we get more backstory with with that character because um, I'm all about him getting, you know, a healthy amount of screen time because I I, I just, I just dig him. Uh, I'm glad he's not a soup. You know, I I just, I just want to see where where they're going to go with that character and with that actor. Yeah, I'm really excited to see him kind of shake off the the Negan personality and and uh, do something different. I have I have nothing negative to say about Negan. It's just nice to see Morgan back in the game doing something other than Negan. And um, you know, next to Urban, those scenes are always going to be really fun to watch. Oh yeah. So as I stop to take a sip of something. Mm-mm. Num num num. Good podcasting. Then we have. And um, I'll mention that uh, another instance where I'll mention the actress's name. We have Rosemary DeWitt showing up as Huey's estranged mom, Daphne. Now, I know you might be wondering, wait, we get why you mentioned Jeffrey Dean Morgan, because, you know, hey, it's Jeffrey Dean Morgan. But you didn't mention any of the other performers who they actually were. Why you, why you make, why you mention her? What's so special about her? I'll tell you what's so special about her. It's not because she's been married to two different well-regarded Hollywood actors. Chris Messina and Ron Livingston. It's not because of her myriad of film roles and a bunch of TV shows that she was on. That's a lie. I am mentioning it for one TV series. She is in the very first episode of Mad Men and throughout that first season. She's the bohemian artist Don keeps hooking up with back in the early days of Mad Men. So I had to give her a shout out. Um, by, by the by the way, speaking of Huey's parents, because that's one of the storylines, is that his father apparently has had a stroke, and Huey's initially feeling guilty about it because he didn't even take his dad's call. And next thing you know, you find that his dad is in the hospital, um, unconscious. I have to be really honest here, which, you know, it's bad enough you pointed out like that Broadway thing, which I totally didn't remember two years. 
I had forgotten Simon Pegg was Huey's <laughs> dad. I went, oh, yeah, Simon Pegg. God, how long has it been since I've seen a scene with them? I don't remember. It's been so long. Um, One of the fun things, for me at least, with the storyline with Huey and his mom, because generally speaking, it's not a fun storyline, Um. We get, I think this is when we get the full explanation for the Billy Joel thing. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Not, not that he needs to explain why he's a Billy Joel fan, but he had made a reference to his mom and Billy Joel bef- in, before. And now we find out what the, the story was. And I got to agree with Huey here. It's like, wow, I would, I, I'd be holding that against her too. Especially back then. It was probably, it was, and coincidentally, considering the timing of when all this is taking place, it could have very well been during the Stormfront tour. And speaking of that, I, give me give me thirty seconds once again. Put it put put it on the clock. Unless Billy Joel, unless you ask Billy Joel, and he specifically said, "No, I don't want my song associated with some, you know, superhero, supervillain, Nazi stormtrooper type." The fact that they go on and on about Billy Joel on the show, and you had a character named Stormfront, and you didn't use the song named Stormfront, still bothers me to this day. Until I read somewhere that they went to Billy Joel and he said no, which I might, I might get why he might have said no. Um, <laughs> I would say lighten up, Billy. Come on. But until I hear that, I blame them. It's my yellow boots, once again. <laughs> <laughs> There's, I love my inside baseball yellow boots. <laughs> comment um oh and, and just to throw in one other thing unless we want to talk about her a little bit more um i i did like the storyline and what the, the explanation for it because that's something that isn't discussed very much people always associate the depression that comes from you know postpartum depression is something that happens initially but you know one either get you know but at, at a certain point in time you know people i think people think it magically goes away and Quite frankly, it could just set in and and deepen and get worse over the course of yeah, time, absolutely. which it clearly did with her character. Yes. And I'll, I'll throw in one more as far as I don't know if the squid counts as a new character exactly. Um, the char- the squid's name is Ambrosius. The only reason I'm mentioning it, it Tilda Swinton is the voice. Of Ambrosius, the squid the that deep is literally hiding in the closet. <laughs> Did we say that they're not about subtlety? Um, <laughs> but I, 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 I did love Tilda Swinton's you know, plaintive pleas to you know, be. Could you, <laughs> could you just put me in the aquarium above the bed? <laughs> it's dark in here. The little, the little like hand, the hand against the glass, against the tentacle. Ah, it's so good. (laughs) So, bouncing through the episodes, one, I I like that you know there's little bits of mystery that are then eventually resolved. Uh, I know as I was watching the first during the first, I think it's during throughout the first episode, and we see Billy have these moments where he's either talking to someone that we can't see or, or looking over at someone that we can't see. And I was trying to think of who it might be. And then when we get the reveal, you know, it, look, it's Karen from For All Mankind. So he's obviously a big fan of For All Mankind. No, no, it's, it's Becca. <laughs> <laughs> Just to remind us, like, hey, she's on both these shows. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> it's one of those, oh, yeah, of course, that's who he's talking to. Who else would he be talking to? You know, makes perfect sense. But what what's I think the stuff with what they're gonna do with Butcher between him being terminally ill and that I think they did they actually put six months on it and yeah at mm-hmm. one point. So not just terminally ill, gonna gonna die sooner than later it's terminally ill. And the fact what he's really doing is more about trying to get Ryan away from Homeland or whatever. And these scenes that, that, and I'm, I'm assuming we may have more than just this one moment with, uh, Becca showing up again as the, the person he's, you know, t- it would be weird if he's talking to her now and then we don't see her again. So I figure I didn't, I didn't go look to see if she's been cast for a future episode, but I'm assuming we'll, we'll see her again. Um, I think it's just the continuing effort 
to humanize that character more and more from season to season. Even though I felt personally, I thought they did a decent job of that from the get go. When once we got his backstory way, way back when, when we see why he has his issues with the, the real issues, why with Homelander and so on and so forth. Um, he he's he's a very interesting character still to this day because he's he's such a brutal force of nature and there's so many things he does and it, it's so clear that he at times he wants to feel pain that he's yeah. got so much guilt on him you know so like his challenges to uh, mother's milk or Marvin all the time and how, and what that results in. Um, he's doing it deliberately just to get a beating, which yeah, there's no yeah. other explanation for it. We've seen him do this before, you know, go in and start a fight at a club just so he can get his ass handed to him. Right. And and I'll say, um, I'll give the show credit because what I, what I do enjoy still about the boys, and, and this goes for a handful of other shows that we we both watch over time, um, they'll do something and then they won't go quite in the direction I would have thought would have been the obvious way to go or just the more predictable way to go. So, like, after everything, after he has the whole, you know, the later after he's revealed all the truth to them and he gets kicked out, and then he has that, and then he ends up saving their asses later on, and we'll and we'll, we'll talk about that scene because that's that's so much fun. Um, everything at the con is fun, quite frankly. Uh, but then he has that scene, just him and Mother's Milk again towards the end of the episode, and you feel like okay, they had their thing, they're reconnecting, whatever. He's going to allow him back in, and he still turns him down. And I went, well, I went, wow, okay. Kudos, because I, I, I thought I didn't, I, it didn't occur to me that he was going to still turn him down. It should have, but it didn't. So, and I kind of, I, I thought that was just a nice turn there. Well, the, one of the things with Butcher is he's, he always comes across as like a contradiction. You know, the things he says, the attitude he has, his behavior, makes you think that he feels and, and thinks one way, but then he does these things that show that, okay, that's not really how he feels about something. Um, and that's, that's, that's great for storytelling. But I mean, if you're in a life or death situation and you have somebody you have to rely on, you can't rely on somebody like that. You know, it, it's putting everybody in danger. So it absolutely does make sense that he would say, no, we, we still can't do it. You know, no matter how much I appreciate you saving her ass. Um, and I, I really like, you know, in, in the first episode of these three where he's, he's seeing his, he's seeing Becca, but he's also talking to Victoria. She's trying to pull him one way. You know, um, and then in comes Kessler trying to pull him another way. So he's got all these different things that are pulling him in different directions. Um, and then the thing we should see, the thing we should know was going to happen is that his response to partnering with Victoria is uh, a butthole text. <laughs> oh, yeah. like, you know, like it's just, nope, it's not going to happen. He's come, he's come to his senses. So um, getting closer and closer to death and dealing with the reality of his, his regrets, uh, he's wising up, but maybe still not a great person to rely on. Right, right, right. That was curious over the course of these three episodes. So early on when he runs into um, when, when he sees Ryan and then he ends up running into Homelander. And within 30 seconds or a minute, whatever, how much time passes, Homelander clearly uses his X-ray vision to see that he's got that the big black mass on his brain, which yeah. is going to kill whatever. My question, and by the way, there's not going to be an answer for this, so it's, it's, it's not even, it's, we'll call it rhetorical. It's, it's more me mocking the show. There's no reason really for Homelander to really decide to use his X-ray vision there, but he doesn't use his X-ray vision later on when he's trying to trying to kill Huey in the in the air ducts. He's just blindly using his heat vision and everything. It's like, wouldn't he just use his X-ray vision and see exactly where he is and like 
get him just like that. Because Huey might be fast. I'm pretty sure, since he doesn't have the compound V in him anymore, I'm pretty sure he's not faster than a laser beam. <laughs> just <laughs> Why? Why is he not using his X-ray vision there to see where he is? Like, oh, there he is Zap dead. Just saying. <laughs> it occurred to me um, when he was going. And it was funny it, when he was going after Huey. And then I thought, wait a minute, he's not using his X-ray vision here. But why did he use it on Butcher in the beginning? <laughs> Just like, you know, I always check to see what's going on inside the heads of people <laughs> I'm talking to. Did he just smell the death on him? I don't know. Anyway, I, I thought it was kind of interesting. So w- there's so much fun stuff, scenes that we get throughout these episodes. Um, I-, I think it's kind of one of the things that we love the most. If, if, if it's not what we love the most about the boys, it's, it's top three. You know, they can put on a crazy tableau for a scene that'll be just re- ridiculously graphically violent or something really disgustingly sexual <laughs> to, to a certain degree. Um, like, for example, at the con. And a lot of fun stuff happens at the con. Before French and Kamiko opened that door, that door to the steam room, I think we all knew that, that the character whose name was uh, Splinter, who's also an actor from Supernatural, who apparently plays, I think, God <laughs> at some point on Supernatural. Certainly not playing God here. Um, we already had picked up on the fact that he's someone who can keep make, creating duplicates of himself. So I was like, oh, oh, okay, they're gonna sh- they're gonna walk and I'm having sex with himself, which is like, oh, didn't you do that in a fantasy with Homelander once in one episode? That's that's <laughs> not that original. And of course, when the door opens, they fu- once again the people behind the boys in Gen V always have to find at least one really repulsive what the fuck sex scene to splatter in our face. <laughs> Where it's literally a toss salad, a human centipede toss salad going on there. I think there's at least five or six of them in a row. Oh boy, it's like no, that, that's okay. Yeah, it was a little, it was a little. Uh, <laughs> it was just a little. Uh. I I also think between myself and Jamie, we would be incredibly remiss if we didn't at least acknowledge. That and apparently, I guess in in the same um, facility, hotel, whatever, where they're having the con, there's also a, <laughs> there's a bat mitzvah going on, I believe, <laughs> which is themed after the marvelous <laughs> Miss Maisel. It's the <laughs> instead it's the marvelous Miss Rachel for the the girl who's having her bat mitzvah. <laughs> oh, it was great. And then, so you get the lovely thing of, you know, people maiming and fighting each other while, you know, you know, have an is playing. You know? <laughs> and at some point, because Firecracker's in the scene, and of course she's got to get her phone going for her to, for her social media followers, whatever, to prove, you know, <laughs> the, the Jews. And she does, this, <laughs> and she does being behind all this. And then she, she has the shot of the uh, the life size cutout of Tony Shalhoub. It's like here's the proof, and it's like Tony oh Shalhoub is the proof. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I I'm not gonna lie. As soon as I, that scene happened, I was like, I I thought of you. I was like, I know there's very few people in the world that can appreciate this as much as Scott. <laughs> it's so great. And, you know, you got to hand it to the show because you have that episode that has that scene, which, you know, you know, leans in on the Jewishness and stuff. stuff. And then we've got a scene in a subsequent episode where we get the whole <clears throat> ice show and the let's put the Christ back in Christmas <laughs> ice oh, rink God. scene, which goes on a Monty Python-esque violent tear like We've we, well, we've seen it on this show and other shows, just a few few shows that can do this. What's amazing that it's kicked off by Homelander when he basically accident you know accidentally cuts the woman in half, but everything else that happens from that point on they do to themselves. <laughs> People's yeah. fingers being cut off by ice skates and being they're having their With throats slashed. Silly accident after another. <laughs> It was such a just bathing in blood, and of course you get that. Ex- you see that news report later on. It's like 
has been temporarily shut down due to a fire at the local, at the ice rink, whatever. <laughs> so it's going to avoid what actually happened or the fact that they're probably all dead because they'll just recast the whole thing and no one will even be any of the wiser. Speaking of everyone killing each other and whatnot, um, one of the interesting uh, subplots we have going this season. It's actually a major plot because we've mentioned uh, Vicky Newman a number of times, and we've also seen the effects of uh, the compound V that she gave to her kid. Um, and again, and again, they went up with another. Yeah, let's give someone a really disgusting, gross power as opposed, you know, like this character's probably going to show up on Gen V in a few seasons if if that show lasts that long. Um, but what it really comes down to is that we we realize that. The presidential and vice presidential candidates are both planning to kill each other. <laughs> <laughs> so that's different. <laughs> that's something. Yeah, that's something to look forward to in the in the media coverage. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of things like politics and media coverage, um, I feel I would be somewhat negligent if I didn't at least acknowledge something that's happened um, since this new season kicked off last uh, Thursday. So one, I, I'm not going to say one can wonder because you don't need to wonder, you know, Th this current season um, on the audience side of the Rotten Tomatoes uh, critical meter, whatever they call it, um, it's gotten its worst rating ever. And if you look, yeah. each successive season has gone down. Now, look, obviously there are problems. There, there, there certainly are people who have just have their issues with the boys in general. Like there, there's things they don't like. There's things, you know, it's running. Sometimes it feels like it's running in place. You know, they need more, they need more plot progression. Where is this going? Blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Okay. But that's minimal. I think it's pretty f well acknowledged what's happening. And it's a certain segment of the fan base whose politics lean a certain way, lean quite right. And the show, which has never been shy about what its politics are, that's, that's been a part of the DNA of the show from the beginning. And one can say, oh, they're leaning a bit more into it this season. Maybe I, I don't know. Uh, there's a couple ways you can say that, but that's really then then you're going on a different uh, offensive lane, I would say. But by and large, the people you know, if if if, if someone's a MAGA supporter and they're upset this season, then where were you last season and the season before? Yeah, that? I and I think that might be. I think that might be part of the point of this season being so damn on the nose, uh, where the other ones, it was, a, yeah, it was on the nose enough where you should notice it, but it wasn't like, you know what I mean? There's a different feeling in these first three episodes well, where it's just a little bit more what's happening right now. Well, the, di the only difference I would say. Because you had the you you had you you had the talking head from Fox News and everything being done that way and 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 all the stuff with Homelander and his supporters and how that season even ended before whatever. I think part of it is the coincidence of this season kicking off with a trial, yeah, of yes. Homelander, yes, and everything and the supporters and everything going on outside, and coincidentally there having been recently a trial with Donald Trump, which obviously was, you know, yep. the first thing, you know, on, on the news every night, every day, whatever. I mean, that's for the show to a certain degree, there's a certain level of providence with that. There's like, Oh, that's kind of a nice coincidence Definitely. That, that worked out that way because that you had to deal with that from what happened at the end of the previous season. So it's not like, the, it's not like two weeks, you know, two months ago, they say, Hey, you know, we should start off with a trial. Just, you know, cause we're going to come on the same time. Like, no, they, they filmed this a long time ago. Yep. Um, it, it it's just, but I find it funny because you know the parallels were kind of always pretty clear. But maybe there's just that the additional couple more. The fact that they're also gearing up for an election here, and we're gearing up for an election at the same time. So it's in the yeah, timing of all of this. 
there's a lot of thing with timing that comes in it. But I also really think that if you if you read any of you know anything from the the writers and the creators of the show, like how shocked they were when people. Um, started to kind of recognize like oh who they they you know these people that thought like homelander was the good guy and then they started to recognize like oh we're being made fun of and the writers are like you didn't realize this well let's just make it clear <laughs> like that's what it feels like like you didn't okay let's just make this clear then yeah which again anyone who thought that I mean, I've not encountered anyone person myself, and I, and I even I know people who lean certainly lean right themselves. But it's like, really, you didn't you didn't pick up on that in season one? Yeah, yeah. I, like, I, I, I can I, I can list about you know a couple dozen scenes which were like, and you you thought he was the good guy. Do you yeah. not remember the airplane scene? <laughs> do you, right. Do you not right. remember that? But this is the perfect tie back to what you were saying at the beginning of of this podcast when you mentioned the idea of like the villain not recognizing themselves as a villain right you know there's a guy who's doing really horrible things right in front of your face we all see it the proof's right there he all but admits to doing the horrible things and you still worship him as the good guy um so when when people started recognizing like oh these writers are actually making fun of me and my family or my beliefs or my political agendas in life, you know, yeah, some people got pretty miffed about it and started doing some scathing reviews and, and what have you. But I think the writers are kind of like, okay, well, um, we thought we had the cat out of the bag, but let's like really let the cat out of the bag. Like, it's just, it's, okay. it's just there. It's, there's and, nothing and, else you can do about and, it. And, like. And, and, but we need to, I think there also needs to be we need to add to the honesty here. It's not just that then. Because no. the people who no. are doing that, they're also gonna have we we however whichever which way they choose to articulate it, they're gonna have a problem with the fact that oh Frenchie is clearly now with a dude, you know. Yes. So that's yes. gonna be an issue. Um and the fact that they bring in a new major character who's a black woman, that's gonna they won't they won't like quite say it. But they're gonna have a problem. Who is you know? the smartest person in the world? Right. So they're like, who is she supposed to be like Hillary and Oprah combined? Anyway, um <laughs> and I, but I, I like I love that idea about with Firecracker, which is, is such like it's 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 both disgusting and terrifying when you like, you know, you see the mirror of reality in it. But it is also really funny to see a character who is you know like she's definitely got you you it's clear who the inspirations are in in real life like who they're pulling from but when you've got somebody like her like yeah you know what her powers aren't great she didn't come from much she she doesn't have a big education she doesn't have a lot of power and money behind her when she stepped into this she kind of accidentally stepped into this but guess what firecrackers get attention they're right. loud and they get attention and they can say the most absurd things. And it's like the more absurd it is, the better it is for the people that are listening. Because like she said, I'm selling the idea of hope, like being a part of something, meaning something. Right. Uh, and so as, as much fun is made of one side or viewpoint, I also think there's moments of like real honesty where it's like, Hey, People don't just wake up and say, I'm going to be an asshole. Right, right, right. So we, we're, we're talking about how things on the show, especially politically wise, but, and, and other things, um, to a certain degree, kind of mirror what's going on in real life. And speaking of mirrors, probably one of the scenes I think that I think both of us probably enjoyed the most because it, you know, harkened back to scenes in previous seasons, um, except maybe this one was a bit more fractured <laughs> and fragmented <laughs> than before. It's Homelander in the mirror. Yes. We love when Homelander talks to himself in the mirror, where it's as if he had he was dealing with some sort of split personality disorder, and. I think if again, I don't since I didn't remember the Broadway thing, I'll probably 
forgot other things as well. I don't recall if he spoke to more than one persona in the mirror. I can't. No, I think it was just a single reflection. This time, because he's already smashed the mirror, we get, you know, we get the multiple reflections who seem to be different versions of Homelander talking to him. Although they pretty much mostly collectively have the same opinion. It's like, oh, you need love. You know, that's, you know, fuck that. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that I think it's it seems like that, and and there's a, there's a number of other moments where um, Anthony Starr really gets to shine. Ha, oh, Star, shine! Look at that. Um, I, I love him suppressing his anger and his impatience, you know, so often throughout these episodes with with whomever is talking yeah. to him, whatever. Yes, and it's like a it's what he's it's like what he's doing all the time. He's just holding back all the time well except for that poor woman who admitted the truth and he just instantly blew her brains out after promising he wouldn't but right and then he has that moment where just to to prove a point and (laughs) he 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 tells the deep to go blow a train yes i i i will have you know i do actually have that highlighted in my notes oh my just when he starts to kneel and I was like, I know they're going to stop this. There's no way. I mean, I know. And part of me is like, you know, the show might go that far. It's like, no, no, no. Something, something, someone will walk in. Something's going to happen to, to that. Yeah, stop yeah. This, whatever. Oh, speaking of a train, um, the other, the other Gen V reference I caught is connected to a train. When they kicked off one of the episodes, I think it's the beginning of an episode where they're clearly filming a new movie. Um, it yeah. se- seems to be some bullshit origin of, of A-Train. And I love that they're going right for the, like, the most obvious, like, oh, it's like a scene from The Wire. Starring he- Will Ferrell. <laughs> and Will Ferrell shows up. <laughs> <laughs> I paused. I actually paused, and I'm like, am I watching the right thing? <laughs> Did you hear the name of the character Will Ferrell was playing? I, you know what? No, I missed it. If I'm not mistaken, the character's name is Coach Brink. I believe that's named after the character that Clancy Brown was on okay. V. I believe his name was Brink. And that can't be a coincidence. I think they're no, and it makes sense because he he pulled in so many of these young soups, so. Yeah. Again, I don't have IMDb up in front of me to check. I, I didn't. I didn't double check that, but I remember thinking that, like, oh, I think that's a Clancy. I just wrote that, wrote down the note, and I never, I never went to to verify it. So, if I'm wrong, I apologize, people. But I'm pretty sure I'm right about that because that's that's a very odd, distinct name to use. I could, I think that was the Clancy Brown character name. God, I hope I'm right on that one. <laughs> I'll feel real stupid if I'm wrong. No, you are. You are not wrong. Oh, thank God. All right. not wrong. Got one right. Yay. Woohoo! I, I, I get one point today. Um I mean I mean there's I mean obviously there's so much more that happens in these three episodes, but we can only talk about so much. But I am I'm, I'm I'll just give my overall feeling and then you can go if you if there's a, a, other points you want to go after, feel free. Um I, I am intrigued by where the season's going. I really want to see how they how they utilize the Sage character. And if she becomes more of an opponent, not an opponent, what's the word? A rival with Homelander, considering at any point in time he can just say, yeah, and, you know, erase her from the face of the earth. But if she has, if she's able to manipulate, kind of like the way, like, like Elizabeth Shue did with him back in season one until she got zapped, um, I'm kind of curious to see where they'll go with her. Um, I'm, I'm excited. So I'm excited about that storyline. The Ryan stuff. Eh. Um, it's okay. Although I do like Homelander's inability to really be, um, an empathetic father because, well, yeah, you're a, you're a sociopath who needs love. That you were, you were talking about Butcher being a contradiction. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. It's interesting that the two biggest characters on the show are both have serious contradictions going on with them. Oh, absolutely. And I, I have to say, I really, we, we kind of discussed this in, in, in our own conversations, but I really love the idea that these three episodes have been so centralized around the theme of fatherhood and we chose Father's Day to record. So mm -hmm. um, it was meant to be uh, one, one of the things that we didn't mentioned but i i really i noticed it and i thought it was a really important character development um we were talking about mother's milk uh and his you know where he's finally standing firm against butcher but there's something else that's going on too um he he's also trying to recruit a train it's like and, and he's doing it in the right way because he sees that a train is sick of it and he needs somebody and he knows that he is messed up with his own brother and his and his nephews and he sees that opportunity to pull him in um but i don't feel like he's doing anything like nefarious like he's doing it in a really respectful way and it leads back to the very beginning of where we see him in the first episode and it's just a glance over his hand as he's grabbing something on the coffee table but he has a book sitting right there that's talking about coping with ocd Right. And we've mentioned that a few times where it's like this character, like you could kind of see that he he's dealing with some OCD, even though they don't outwardly say it. Um, so I just thought that was really nice um, seeing him kind of come into some strength and power and be able to create good boundaries for himself and handle his anxiety. Uh, and then the last thing is when we were talking about the the fracture in the glass when uh, Homelander was having the conversations with his multi self. Um, one of them said to him, John, you need to go home. And I'm really interested on, on what that's about. Right. Because it sounds like, cause they, they, they um, they were showing us flashes and it seemed like they were more talking about the lab rather than the, yeah. the quote unquote home he was supposedly brought up in or the, the where, where we, and we've gone there already in previous seasons. So, yep. you know, that was all just, you know, bullshit to begin with. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's a, it, I mean, there's probably other things we, we could have touched on as well. You know, we didn't really get into anything of the stuff that happened with Kamiko, where we're, we're going to get more into her backstory and her past with, with the, what was it, the, the sh shining sun or whatever. Yeah. Uh, that, whatever. And she runs into a, a, a woman who obviously knows her from before. Um, Drinking her two to three to six to eight beers. Right. <laughs> um, and they really ra ratcheted up the the uh, regenerative because apparently she got splattered on the uh, you know concrete and then you know put her face. Back oh yeah, yeah. Love weird it. little. There was a weird baby arm for a minute. <laughs> the baby <laughs> arm. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I I thought it was a good start to the season. Um, but I think we firmly like the show, and you know, even if there's you know we might. If there's something to point out that we have any issues with, we certainly will. But um, I'm just curious where they're going with certain things. You know, we didn't even didn't mention the fact that the deep actually spe uh, after Sage kind of pumping him up, so to speak, um, not before sh they, some other pumping they do later on. Um, <laughs> the over a uh, over a blooming blossom, you know, blooming onion blossom. The blooming onion. Um, the fact that um, he actually talks back to Ashley for the first time. Yeah, Ash Ashley has taken down like several notches in these episodes. I just I. I my God, I, Ashley's character, like this character, is just so funny because the, she didn't have to. What did she have? Three lines, maybe in all three episodes, maybe four lines. It's just like she's always in the background, just crapping herself. <laughs> it's like, and then you see that she had a letter of resignation, you know, and she went and shredded that, and she's just she's she's always just been a mess. She's a mess. Right. Uh, when she's leaving the, the 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 room, that that one scene, and she keeps dropping stuff. I thought that was kind of <laughs> nice. Yes. Even as the doors are closing, you see her drop something. Else. Yes. So yeah, we are looking forward to the remaining five episodes that we will be talking about for the remaining five weeks. But I think now we can turn the page or open a pop up book. <laughs> <laughs> 
because we have another show we want to talk about a little, little bit, just a little bit, maybe more than a little bit. We'll see. And that show is evil. <laughs> Couldn't resist. <laughs> I love this show. Um, I think there are other folks. My friends got me into it. it. You know, the first season was on CBS proper, and then it went from season two on. It became a Paramount Plus kind of a deal, which meant the the shackles were off. You 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 could do you could curse a little bit. You could you could show a little boob or whatever, but you could also have more intense storylines that maybe the normal CBS network crowd might not. You know, it's not something the NCIS people are normally watching. Yeah. And again, we, we, it's been mentioned usually on our best of the seasons, uh, excuse me, best of the year, uh, podcasts in the past, but I don't know if we've ever actually gotten to cover the show. So we decided we will, um, devote a segment to, at the end of our boys podcast to evil, which sounds really, I like the way that sounds. <laughs> <laughs> you know? We're going to divide this segment to evil. And we're also going to talk about this TV show. Um, now, this is, as far as I know, as far as I've heard, as far as I think it was even announced, this is supposed to be the, the final season of evil. Yes. I'm not clear why one of the main people, stars of the show, Posts things on Twitter or X Twitter. I seem to indicate talking about trying to get a season five. I'm like going, but but it's the final season. Didn't they already announce the final season? Why, why do you keep bringing that up? I don't know what she's thinking. Oh, this for you know who must be now. But let, let's relish what we have while we can. And we've gotten four episodes of Evil so far. So let me just give you the quick rundown on the four, and then we can just dive into them. We started off with How to Split an Atom. That was the one with the particle accelerator and the portal to hell. That's the one where Kristen finds out exactly what happened to her egg, and she kicks her mom out of her life once and for all. Or so she says, because, you know, we've seen that before. Second episode was How to Train a Dog. That was the one where the team goes out to investigate a suspected werewolf, which turns out to be killer robot dogs that aren't nearly as frightening as those robot dogs from Black Mirror. Third episode was how to slaughter a pig. That was the one where they investigate these rumors of these demonically possessed pork products, which may or may not be true. Or was it just pigs being fed pigs? Or was it the demon that might have initially been possessing the farmer's son? I'll be honest with you, I'm still not sure. It's probably both. (laughs) And then we have the episode that just aired this week. Oh, and it was such a good one. How to build a coffin. This one where a demon is making it quite hard for people to formulate clear thoughts and sentences, which means they probably haunt this podcast half the time. And, <laughs> and there's so many other jokes I'd like to make, but then we'd be veering into politics once again. When going, <laughs> Gee, I wonder what I can mean by that. Oh, and there's also another demon, a little fella. He is a demon of grief who has apparently attached himself to Wall Sean's father, Ignatius. So those are the episodes. Um, I, was, I was talking to Jamie a few months before we started recording, and I said one, one of the nice things about this show, and which I think will make it, um, compared to some shows we've t- covered in the past, uh, or a, a simpler show to, to talk about, is they've really kind of, they, they've got these separate storyline tracks going with each of these main characters, and you can kind of group two supporting characters together as well. Um, obviously some will intersect at different times. I think one of the interesting things is to see how they do eventually all intersect, you know, like when is the stuff with David going to have anything to do with anybody else? I suspect at some point it will, but for, but for, for a while now it hasn't had anything to do with anybody else. But I think, and this is a show that I think when it first started, I thought David was the main character. I, I now realize I think it's Kristen that's the main character. Yeah. Um, so let's go with Kristen first. And Kristen, and we can kind of pair Andy, her hubby, with her. I do find it interesting, the scenes in this in these episodes where she wants others to open up. But I noticed up until towards the very end of the last one, she's the one who does that the least. Oh, she, yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, she really, but she's, it's always been that way with her, you know, since the beginning of the, the series, she says one thing and then she does the opposite of the thing she wants everybody else to do. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, wait, another case of contradictory nature. <laughs> wait. It's almost if that makes a character interesting. It's almost like it's a theme. Um, and there's no father. Oh, wait. Anyway, uh, oh, speaking of fathers <laughs> and Father's Day. Oh, Andy. Oh, man, that's tough. That is tough. So, and and she does, now she does go as far as mention the needle to them, as far as when, not just Andy being in the hospital. So she does go a little bit further with it. I have to say one of the things I'm waiting to see, if, and now again, there's no guarantee it'll even happen at all, but I'm trying to imagine if it does happen. If there is ever the true reveal to Kristen, et cetera, of what's really happened to Andy, how is that going to go? Yeah. Now, the fact that Leland tried to program him to kill his own daughter, also kind of a big deal. I wonder how Cheryl's going to feel about that if she should find out about that. Again, there's, there's, it's every likelihood they will ne- she will never know. Because there's no reason why she would know. Unless Leland stupidly just tells her, thinking he's, you know, Im- impervious to anything she could possibly do. Which I could I I could kind of see because he just he loves toying with her so much, you know, with the with the literal glass ceiling. Right. You right. know. Um I, I could see him almost having a bragatory, you know, conversation about this or you know, or the pieces may be getting put together behind the scene, but I, I, I don't understand. Like going forward, are you know? Yeah, she she tells them that she finds this syringe and stuff. So I'm really curious if she's held on to it. Does is Ben gonna take? It seems like something Ben would go. Let's find out what it is. You know, <laughs> like let's see what's inside of this syringe. Um, so there's a few ways it it could come into light. The question is, is there a satisfactory way for that to happen in one remaining half of a season. Well, the syringe was what he ended up plunging into himself, which is what right. caused him to be in the hospital. And obviously they did a toxicology report on him. To, so the impression that she seems to be left with is that he tried to kill himself doing this. Right. Um, but did she give that syringe? I mean, did she admit to finding that syringe? I, you know, I would assume so. But she also was having problems talking. Well, they're going to, I mean, there's go, there's also going to be, an, they'll, they'll see where the injection was. So it's not going to be, unless they're, and, I don't, and it sounds like by the end of it, he wants to be admitted to a mental hospital. So we'll see where they go with that. Um I did love the little touch, though, where we had the demon of grief show up at the hospital room. Yes, at the very end, we see, see him hanging out over there. And that's uh, it was a nice touch. I like when they do things of that like that. Um, again, so I, I I I have grown to like Kristen's character more season after season because I find her to be one of the more unique. Um leads on a series i've seen of this yeah. nature um because you know there's a certain the show to a certain extent is like oh it's it's kind of like the x-files except they work for the church and kind of thing yeah. which kind of puts her kind of you know they kind of took scully and split them into ben and kirsten <laughs> so to speak um but I, she always has so much going on with her <laughs> and there are so many weird issues that are going on with her um, but they're also with with a with a few wacky exceptions, they're relatable. You under you you get the issue she has, um, and 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 trying to be mom to those four daughters who are all that, that's exactly what I was thinking. It's like the girls are all like actually pretty lovely people, but like that's a lot of chaos. No one's gonna be sane living in that. They're just not. And I keep going. How long are you think you gonna be able to keep them all in that one room? Because <laughs> a couple of them are, should, or should, I feel should, a couple of them should already be at the end. Like, yeah, I'm gonna want my own room. 
Yeah, and you know, this bunk bed thing ain't flying anymore. It's not working. I, I will say one thing too with the show that always kind of gives me a giggle, but like all of the characters in the show have like really amazing living spaces. Mm. Um, just this, this set of just a living space is so well thought out in this. And it, it is like when you're with David, that space, you know, it's just like you really feel David there. Like you feel his lifestyle, his struggle, everything about him. And then you go, you know, if you go into Kristen's house and it's just like it's filled with life and noise and sound and, uh, you know, the little stars cut out everywhere. It's sort of mystical. And uh, and then Ben's is just very like analytical. And it's, it's a really great set design. It's basically what I'm saying. But if I ever had that many people in my life that lived in such amazing spaces, like... I, I wouldn't leave. I wouldn't leave. These places are so cool. Yeah, well, David, I think David is more about the sparseness of it. Um, yeah. It's, it's, it's a very, it's a very, uh, the, because I think it's it's in the confines of, a, of essentially a church, um, hence why there's like incredibly high ceilings. Yeah. But the room itself is, is, it's a fairly small, narrowish room, which not that, which and there's not that much to it because, well, he's, involved in the priesthood and they're not, <laughs> no, it's Sim- not yeah it's that yeah. simplicity and but, the, but i love it's like the centerpiece of that room is the bed oh yeah the bed and, you uh, know and how when, that bed is lit up especially when they once they put the, the mosquito when they had the mosquito netting yes. and stuff to you it's know so great getting the like the, the, keep the Kristen mosquito away <laughs> and ben is like this this great loft space whichever which and i i've been in lofts like that that thing you know those those type of apartments actually do exist that, you know, it's, and, you know, it, depending where it is, it's usually, you know, old where old warehouse districts and areas of Manhattan or Brooklyn, probably Williamsburg. It's probably where that's, which I'm, I suspect is where that's supposed to be. I don't know if they've specifically said he lives in Brooklyn, but if I had a guess, that's what it looks like to me. Um, and you know we, and of course we don't think about any of these characters and how much and how much that rent must be or whatever because you know I'm sure. <laughs> right. Sure, sure, you know, this isn't like Friends where that there's no apartment like that that doesn't exist. And <laughs> <laughs> no architect has ever come up with an apartment like that. An architect came up with that for a sitcom set, not for an actual, <laughs> not an actual apartment. Yeah, I love. I you get you know you can see all of Ben's projects that he's working on, and right. you know. And and it's great because you'll see things in the background sometimes that kind of like, you know, go back to, you know, five, six, ten episodes ago. Right. You know, something he's got working in the background. And uh it's it's just one of those things that I really enjoy. The 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 almost campiness, like they don't the, like they, they allow themselves to be a little silly with the demons. Oh, you absolutely. know, absolutely. They well, one of the things that's lovely about the show is um, they are able to play with and shift tone on the show pretty well. You can have an episode that features any number of moments that are genuinely, you know, chilling or scary, or at least to a certain extent. I mean, I'm sure right. there's people watching who don't get scared at anything, which, you know, I'm not going to say, it's not like I'm watching with the, you know, with the lights on, I can't watch it. But they... There's not there's nice little touches that they do, especially when they play with things in the dark or in the corners, because we all have, depending on what age we are, we've had those moments like that, and yeah. it's a nice thing I've seen because it reminds me of certain horror movies I've seen where it's just this weird area of shadow behind a door, and that's what's frightening because. You're not sure is there something there or not, and we see that happen with specifically with Ben actually. Um, over the, it's interesting that Ben is m- even more so than than Kristen. You know, he is the big sciencey skeptic of, yeah. of the three, more even more so than she is, and he's also the one who's had you know some crazy shit gone. He's been dealt with at his apartment. Which there is no other explanation for. I I, I kind of find it funny. Where kind of he's kind of just put one out of his mind and now he's got a new one because ever since his experience of being blasted yeah. at the particle accelerator, he seems to be, uh, we'll say haunted by a, by an actual gin. 
And, you know, I, I just love he's, he's trying to run all the different experiments and he turns it into something, you know, whether it's an internal monologue that's manifested somehow, whether it's a trick of the light, whatever. And it's one of those, you have to watch it closely when he's doing those earlier episodes and you can kind of say, it's like, oh, it's, you almost wouldn't know if, if, if you're not really, if, if you're not, if your eyes aren't locked in on the screen, if like, say you're eating while you're watching, maybe you say your, your eyes might look up and down. You a couple times you might miss something. You might not see like it's literally in the corner of the screen or just to the side. You see just a little bit of what what it is he's talking about. And I would actually rewind it a couple times. Like, oh, that's really that's really nice. Uh, the, the, the the people behind obviously um, the the creators behind this it's Robert and Michelle King, who are the people behind you know the Good Wife and the Good Fight. Um. And this is a sh- this is something which is obviously quite different, even though it might share a lot of the same actors um, and and Elizabeth also, by the way. Um, <clears throat> I, I am consistently impressed, and obviously, it's also it's, it's based on whoever the di- whoever is directing a, a specific episode. How really well they're capturing. Um, the elements of horror on the show that they're doing a really good job of that. Um, and you can have these moments of just the, the dread is palpable. Whether it's walking down that corridor alongside the particle accelerator and looking into, you know, the abyss, or it's what's happening in the shadows of, of Ben's apartment or even, um, Kristen's house at times, whatever the, yep. they, they, they they have, I mean, I, I hate to say they have fun with it, but they do have fun with it. But it works really well, and I, I it my eyes rarely roll when I watch the show. I'm always kind of like, oh, they're really doing a nice job with this. I, I really yeah, like they've done a really great job too. When you're when you're dealing with the 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 overall subject of religion, uh, science, it there. They're not, it's, they're poking fun of it, but there's like, they're respectfully poking fun of all angles. There's, there's nothing that they're, they're blasting as being wrong. They're, they're, they're poking fun and poking holes in science, but they're equally doing it to religion. Um, they're even doing it to skepticism. Uh, and it, I think that's why so many different people can watch this show, no matter like where they kind of find themselves sitting in right. is because occasionally they're going to be forced to think for half a second, like, what if I'm wrong? But so are the other guys. Uh, it's, it's really great how they can, they can keep a balance on all of that because you never really look at all, you know, we got these three different representations, the characters representing that part. And it's like, you got somebody like Ben, you know, and Ben, has something traumatic happen to him. He doesn't really talk about it, but then he starts to see the gin, and it's just like you said, it's like that little flash out of the corner of your eye. We've all experienced that. Did I just see something? That thing. And so he puts it away, puts it away, puts it away until eventually he finally accepts it. He accepts it. He's the skeptic, you know, he's a scientist, but now he accepts that this is there. But now let's break that down. And, and break that down into science. So you right. see now, now that's a part of science. It's no longer against science. It's now a part of it. Um, and it, it's, it's really great how they're able to, to do that without really being offensive to, to one uh, segment or the other. Um, and then just like, they know where to make fun of things. I guess is what I'm saying. They know what to make fun of because I mean, I like, you know, the, the demon, oh, there's a demon and it just flipped you off. Right. You know. Yeah. Well. Yeah. And and to be clear, and that's something I want to mention about Ben, but I'll I'll skip back to it in a moment. I'll I'll remember it. Um, they take, I I believe they take careful care. They never specifically do anything to mock religion. They don't, right. They never mock. They never mock the Vatican or or Catholicism or whatever. The characters from that, you know, good or bad, you know, you know, they're yep. they're believable, whatever. Um. The, if they're gonna be silly and have fun with, or goof on stuff, it'll be on the side of evil, 
it'll be what's going on in that office yep. <laughs> and what yep. and, and the thing, and the things that Leland does <laughs> and whatever who Leland who can veer be, between you know being the most horrible creature ever and then being just outright silly and goofy you know and then funny like showing oh Michael Emerson can do anything quite frankly yeah but uh, but I've noticed and and oftentimes some of the most sympathetic or interesting characters are you know members of the archdiocese I mean yeah, Sister Father, Andrea. Sister Andrea and, and Father Ignatius, you know, the two of them. I mean, love Wallace Shawn. I've loved, been a Wallace Shawn fan for probably 40 something years. You know, I, you know, either people remember him from going back to my dinner with Andre or obviously the Princess Pride or his, he was, he was actually a recurring, he, he, he had recur, a recurring appearance on Taxi back in the day. Young uh, Sheldon. Um, wouldn't know. I never watched it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sorry about that. But uh, and in the episode, the, the the most recent episode, his scenes with Sister Andrea, and by the way, I know Andrea Martin going all the way back to SCTV back in the late seventies, early eighties, and um, I've I've liked her in things, I've disliked her in things, like I, I hated her and her character in uh, uh, Only Murders in the Building. Couldn't stand the character, couldn't stand any scene with her, but I adore her on this show she is yes easily she's e- great. easily one of my two or three favorite characters you know top two or three favorite characters there is nothing more fun and we got it at the end of the previous season i believe and we get it in this episode of watching sister andrea walk around trying to smack bash you know <laughs> demons hedge clipper hedge clipper <laughs> <laughs> Um, I mean, the scene that she, in the last season that she, when she's walking through, um, Kristen's house and going to town on him. And then we get to see it happen again here, except it's a little, tr- it's a bit trickier because you got the little one that's barred itself into the side of, uh, Father Ignatius. And that was kind of beautifully rendered, by the way. And then you've got the, ju- the, 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 the demon of words or whatever we, we're calling that yes. one. Yes. Um, who just becomes more and more engorged <laughs> and disgusting as the episode proceeds. And, and then he literally, he Winnie the Poohs himself into the room by eating so many words. Oh, my God. But um, she has been an enormous amount of fun. And I will admit that um, the show is even able to do things to emotionally move me. The the scene between her and Father Ignatius when they're talking about um, the previous person who was in charge who had passed away. Yeah. Um, and if I'm not mistaken, I think that actor actually did pass away, if I'm not mistaken. If I'm wrong about that, I'll double check that too. Um. But I was actually genuinely moved by that, and yeah. that was something special. Um, I want to let me speaking about things from last season. I wanted to just briefly circle back to Ben again. Um, in this most recent episode, he has that whole thing that happens where the the woman shows up at his house, and she claims that he had called her. And, you know, kind of like yeah. you, kind of a you up kind of a thing, whatever. And obviously, they're they're referencing things, and I'm sitting there watching. I was like. She looks vaguely familiar, but um, I I don't remember. Was she? Did I miss something? So I had to go back. She um actually the, the character's name was Renee. Um, she was in the seventh episode of last season. Yeah, she was part of that big witch cult the thing, thing with the right? cults. You know, the the de- in the episode was the demon of cults. Again, I. I'm happy if I can remember something from a couple of months ago. I'm not going to remember a stand, what nah. essentially a standalone episode of evil from last season, unless it was like something truly significant. And that, to me, that episode didn't specifically stand out as much as a few others did. Like the last one with Sister Andrea and the Demons, or the one where they keep riding down the road and shit keeps happening on that stretch of highway. That's a good, that's really, that's, yeah. a, that's a creepy as fuck. That's a, it really is. So, uh, we've, we've talked about Ben, we've talked about, uh, Kristen and Andy, David. So David's thing, and I mentioned it, and, uh, I alluded to it earlier. He's had this thing going on that people haven't quite else have quite been aware of where he's been recruited by this other organization connected to the Vatican. It sounds, you know, like, you know, and, and you know, 
you know, we were it's French intelligence, where the hell it was, I forget at this point. Where, but now it's switched to hands to someone like else. Like a secret, secret society of priesthood that yeah. are. It feels it's like, like a CIA yeah, priesthood. It feels like CIA slash Illuminati to me. Yeah, it sounds yeah. Sounds like to me. Um, so now they're playing into the idea that he may have what they call remote viewing powers. Um, and apparently, I, I think, if I'm not mistaken, this is one of those things that um, the CIA was known to have attempted to experiment yeah. in, in the past. Um, and and, and uh, well, I shouldn't say, obviously, you know, probably slash apparently didn't work out. So now they're playing into that here. Um, we'll see where it goes. I keep thinking, okay, this is probably supposed to be, you know, the first step in in unlocking the idea that maybe they they suspect that David might have more advanced psychic abilities, and that's why he's kind of maybe a you know, almost like a chosen one kind of a thing. We'll see. It, it they've played it so odd and ambiguous the whole time and i'm 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 kind of like okay i'm not impatient with it because i got we got plenty of time i do want to see if there is a good payoff to this and i do want to see if it connects to everything else or will it continue to exist as a separate david storyline and never intersect with what's been going on with everybody else especially the the christ and stuff which seems to be tied to the major storylines of the show overall because that feeds into the whole, you know, title of the show, Evil, and because that's who Leland works for. And no conversation about Evil is complete unless we talk a bit about Michael Emerson's Leland. Um, and as I've said, and I've repeated myself a number of times, and I'll do it one more time, I think that Michael Emerson, who people, obviously a lot of people who listen to us, they know him. The first thing they think of is lost. Obviously. Benjamin Linus, we get it. Makes sense. That should, that probably, you know, if you're ranking his things, that's probably the number one thing on his fucking, right. you know, that people know. Some people might go to pot, um, person of interest. Some people might go to, I think it was the, that legal show that he was, he, that he first got really well, uh, got a lot of recognition. I think he might have got an award for it, if I'm not mistaken. He might have got an Emmy for it or something. Um, not Boston League. Uh, the pra- I think it was the practice. I think it was the practice. Yeah, because it wasn't Boston League. It was the practice. The one with uh, Dylan. What, what's his face? And uh, <laughs> I know what his name is. And so on. And he and he keep any he, he pops up in things all the time. We we talked about the fact he popped up for a couple an episode or two of Fallout. I just realized today, you know, today that he's actually he he just got used as a voice on the sup the the ongoing Superman cartoon that I watch, and the credits gave away something because in the show you don't they, you think he's just something called Primus or whatever, but in the credits it said Brainiac. It's like oh, I guess that's Brainiac. Nicely done, idiots who did the credits for the show. <laughs> Thanks for giving that one away, morons. <laughs> um, getting to the point was, I think with all these characters he's played, whether it be the repressed character and tightly wound character he played on Person of Interest, or the mercurial, you know, the villain who doesn't believe he's a villain, there's a great example of it, Benjamin Linus on Lost. Yeah. And we felt that way about him as well when we got to a point where we no longer regarded him as a villain because he was redeemed by the end, you know. Um, but I think when they gave him this opportunity, they said, okay, here's a character where you can just go to town. You might have scenes that, you might have scenes that might make you seem like one of these previous characters. Oh, you might be a little bit like the character from Birds of Interest here, or a little bit like Benjamin Linus here, right. even the killer from you know whatever your name was on that show there. <laughs> but you, you know that Spinal Tap thing where you, you go to eleven, you can go to twelve. Yeah. <laughs> yes. You can be, and you can go as leering, loopy, whatever you know, but but just keep it within some realm of believability, which you can do because of how good an actor you are. And let's just have fun with this. And he, to me, seems to be having so much silly 
fucking fun. <laughs> I, I keep, I, I want to see bloopers with him from this show. Oh, but gosh. Just him, just like this season, just how he's, he's screwing around with Christine Lottie's shuttle character. Yes. Like you yes. meant, like the glass ceiling gag is brilliant gag. Brilliant gag. Then you get to the whole thing where he, when Kristen gets in his face and he's crying, I'm like, you're going to have to raise a baby. <laughs> just good stuff. And then we see it put into action this episode. By the way, I got to give it to the Kings again. I want a mobile that plays a music box version of the theme from Psycho. When I realized that's what it was, I could, I, I was right. I was like, wait a minute. And it's the entire piece, you know, it's like, it's psycho. They, <laughs> I don't think that exists in reality, but I want it. I really do. I don't, I don't, I don't want the kit, but I, I want the mobile. But he, just in this last episode, he, he veers from, Goofy comedy of what he's doing with all the with with, with all the baby vomit and shit and piss and, and everything else and how he's reacting when he's hiding in the bathtub and everything else and yes. trying to get, get in the closet to the fact that in the same episode you can see him basically program someone to kill kill their daughter that shows you the wacky and bizarre range of that character as well as Emerson himself um, he I mean. He's one of the th things I used to, to lure people to watch the show. Cause like, I was like, Hey, did you watch a lot? You know, cause most people I know they watch Lost. Some people didn't like it at a certain point. Some people stuck with it, whatever, but they always liked him. It's like, did you like blah, blah, blah from all? Like, it's like, Oh, you have to see him on this show. <laughs> you got to see. Yep. Him. Yep. And, and, uh, he's so good. Yeah. And, and he's also, uh, I'll add to like his, his shenanigans in the show. I mean, like anytime he had to, has had to deal with, the kids okay. and again that's again that's like god hats off to the writers to be able to go get up that close to a subject matter that gets real icky if you go an inch further you oh, know when he they, was, they, the video they, game stuff with them was yes. really like really on the edge there like yeah wow, they're 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 toying with things here which if they go just one step too far yep. they're gonna hear it from somebody yep but they really bring that menace and the danger of that, like full up without having to face the trauma, yeah. you know? And I think that's something that they continuously do. They bring that danger all the way up and, but they don't make you feel the trauma. Right. I mean, he, he's a wonderfully malevolent character and there's a certain, um, uh, it's, it sounds like I'm referencing my own cats here and where, um, uh, it's funny cause I just mentioned, I just, I just mentioned the idea that he's, um, apparently been cast as the voice of a uh, brainiac on, on the, on the animated series I currently watch. But in a lot of ways, he could easily be a very mixiplic like character cause he's an evil little imp, just like those two, yep. just like these two rat cats a lot now. <laughs> um, who, oh, I'm just going to look around. I don't even know where they are. Oh, well, there's one of them. Okay. Shh, shh, shh. Anyway, wait, where are you? You're not. Um, okay. That's not her. Wait, is that the cat or is that my Batmobile? I can't tell. Anyway. Um, God damn it. I need glasses. Um, where was I? Oh, because, um, look, take how they've been torturing Andy and the trigger that they use. Yeah. There's a million things he could have used. And instead he plays this obnoxious, almost chipmunk-esque version of Feliz Navidad. <laughs> and that's a, which is, which is something like a little bastard kid would come up with. Just, just yep. to fuck with him. Just like the thing that they used originally to put the doctor, the psychiatrist under a spell, which is still there. And I love that they referenced it. And then we learn that his, the woman who's, you know, that I, I don't, know the word his assistant that's executive assistant outside works for leland which is how yep. he's aware which i'm like oh that makes sense how he, how he becomes aware of stuff that's going on at the office all the time whatever um but it's all these little little devices and whether it be uh, the, the thing with the kid it's, it was through a video game and all these other things it's all like it's all things that are almost you know evil childlike 
You know, yeah. he's like the original problem child, except he's like 50 something years old or however old he's supposed to be. Well, there's like, he's got some, he gets some sick joy out of the things that he uses. Like, you know, like you're saying, like this, the, the little chip monkey Felice Navidad thing. It's like a little stuffed animal that like plays the music. And anybody who's had kids, know, they've all experienced it. Somebody's bought their damn kid one of those things that sing an annoying chipmunk version of a song and they play it at nauseum and you just sit there and wait for the battery to die on this thing and and hope they forget about it so you can throw it away when they're not looking and having this this sick twisted sense of humor that he has of taking something that's just utterly annoying to adults it's just this little added joy that that's what he can use to control somebody right and also, there's probably a few things he enjoys more other than, you know, serving his satanic master than annoying the fuck out of people. Yes. He, <laughs> yes. he has done that in any number of episodes, any number of ways. So, yeah, it's interesting. So, uh, as we look forward to what's coming the rest of the season, you know, obviously the, it's the curiosity of will there be will there be more with the Andy storyline or or is he just going to be in a psychiatric facility and, and if we kind of usher if we shuttle him away does that mean that there's less opportunity for them to find out the truth about what happened to him or not um is shuttle's character actually redeemable or not because we seem to be playing back and forth with her i don't know how redeemable she can be since she was in on the, all the the end yeah. brainwashing yeah. and and whatever. Um, although it'll be interesting, like I said, if she ever some ever should find out that Leland actually tried to program Andy to kill one of her grandchildren. What's in those bottles? <laughs> Which yeah. seems to be some sort of uh, semi fountain of youthy thing, whatever. And I was like, going, well. It's not like they're CGIing her up, and she looks like she's twenty years younger. It's an, it was an odd choice for them to do. I'm, I'm kind of curious where where that's going to go. If there's more to it than than just what they hint at, because a lot of things it might just be something that you hint at, like oh that's something, but we're not going to really go into it much more right. than that. Although I do like the idea of maybe there being a reveal if if we get into like really. Um, if we, if the more we move away from episodic and it becomes more serialized as the storyline starts to become a bigger deal, which I, I suspect could happen as we get towards the latter part of the season, I would love an episode where we discover that Leland's been around for like the last 150 or something years and it's that substance which has been keeping him, you know, right. at, at a certain age, which I, which I could see them, I could really see something like that happening. And again, also the curiosity of either, does David's the that whole thing with David and his po- possible abilities? Where are we really going to be going with that? Um, are we touching on that Grace character again or not? They keep referencing her, even though I thought she was kind of like the least interesting thing they ever did on the show. But um, but will it tie into the bigger storylines that I think we're more interested in? And what is going to happen with the Jin with Ben? Is it you know because you know. I know there are things that that Jin is supposed to be able to do. Or are they going to play into that? Is it going to go away? Is it going to become something bigger? There's a lot of questions I have about the series, but they're all questions are like, oh, I'm looking forward to how we're going to resolve these, you know, week after week. Um, I, it's much like the X Files, which obviously the show has been compared to. It's a show that kind of works on both the episodic and serialized level, which is what they've been doing, and they've been done for the most part. They've done a pretty good job. Of it. Yeah, I mean, you're you've got the you've got half of the the storyline is is really pushing towards I think the uh, raising the Antichrist, and I, I'm sure that that's that's going to triangulate everybody's story at the end. It's got to come into this somehow. Um, how how do you do that with you know you know what we have left of the season? I have you know, no pun on the subject, but I have faith in these writers to be able to give us something that we're satisfied with at the end. But um, there's a lot going on. I'm sure that there's some storylines that probably had to be cut and redirected, knowing that they weren't going to get, a you know, another season. Um, but for the most part, I feel like they'll, the follow through will be, will be good. They've, they haven't let me down yet. Yeah. And if I'm not mistaken, I didn't think to look ahead of time. I, I think it's a, it's actually a, I could be wrong, but I'm no. So, pardon the clicking you hear. I'm just, I just want to look this up instead of trying to just say something and then be totally wrong about it. If I'm not mistaken, 
Yep, right now. Evil. Evil. If I'm not, I think they might have had more episodes than normal this season. Am I wrong about that? I think I am wrong about it. There will be, oh wait, 14. That's got to be more than normal. Yeah, 10. Yeah. 13. Oh, they had 13 in season two. Interesting. Well, it's 14, which I think outside the first season, which is which was on CBS, so probably had, no, 13. So it's the most episodes it's ever had in one season. We had two ep- two seasons of 13 episodes each, one episode, one season where they had 10, and this is going to be 14. And if I'm not mistaken, don't they usually have a break, like mid-season? Isn't this one of those shows that goes on a break? I will tell you right now, because I think they're not going to have a break this time. Nope, they do not have a break schedule. Okay. It's going to run from, well, now, and it's going to end on August 22nd. All right. I'm just looking. 22nd, 15th, 8th, 1st, 25th, 18th, 11th, 4th. Ooh, July 4th. June. Nope, no break. It's going to be straight through. Not going okay. to do that better call. It's all bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? Out of a handful of shows that I'm currently watching, this is w- one of them that I I, I look forward to. I'm, I'm, I'm excited. I set the time aside and watch it as soon as I'm available to watch it. So. Yeah, I guess I'll be doing that until August. Is it going? On? And also, and I think most people watching have already noticed this. We didn't mention it. Um, what they've been doing this season is when they have a new opening, uh, a somewhat new opening credit sequence. Yeah. Which uh, this one I I like for the most part. I could do without the exploding stuff towards the end because that's too reminiscent of the good fight, and I really hated the opening cards for the good fight. Quite frankly, even if it tied into the final episode, I don't care. It's still hated it. Um, anyway. Um, but they have a little thing that pops up where you normally see like the skip intro, skip yeah. intro. <laughs> You'll they've, be they've got these warnings and I need to go back and watch them because the last episode had a very specific, um, incident that happened to a specific woman in Valley Park when she, <laughs> she, I think she, she lost all her hair when she, I was like, wait a minute, have they been doing that with the other ones? <laughs> like, I gotta go back and watch. Have I missed something? Cause I just, I saw, you know, don't do it. And I was like, wait. Did it then tell us something that happened to somebody else? I don't know. I need to go back and check. I'm not sure about that. Anywho, if if you like this podcast, you'll like hanging out on our Facebook page as well. <laughs> it's the Serious TV Drama Podcast page. Like the page. Join the conversation about shows like Evil, The Boys, or any other TV show you want to talk about. Or movies, or however, whatever else that's on your mind. If it's inappropriate, I'll take it down. But... Psh- I don't think anything is inappropriate. Facebook police might, but I, you can follow us on X Twitter. I don't know what the hell we're called there. Same with Instagram. I don't know what we're called. It. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Cause no one ever does put out these things. No one ever does. I've, ne- I've never seen an uptick of one on either of those things. <laughs> not one for what? Three, four, five, whatever number of years. Not. One. I haven't, there's got not been one more follower on Instagram. Serious TV drama. One more. Or on X Twitter, I have no idea what we are. STVD podcast, whatever. Not one. Really. really. If me as an individual, and I don't try to get any, I, I mean, I, I, I have a, whatever. I, don't, I know I have a shitty number of followers, probably like 170 or 60 or 80. I don't know. And people, you know, it's like, well, because I don't solicit followers. I don't go out. I don't, and I don't make a point of it. So I don't care. I don't, I'm, I don't need the, I don't need to like, oh, I've got 1.2 thousand followers. Who the fuck cares? I don't, I don't even, I don't even like 1.2 people. Well, why would I care about 1.2 thousand? Anyway. It's late. I should stop talking. We'll be back at the end of <laughs> we'll be we'll be back at the end of this week, I think, to talk about the latest episodes of both The Boys and Evil. And you know what? I even got the titles from both. So the next episode of The Boys is going to be titled "Wisdom of the Ages," and the next episode of Evil, "How to Fly an Airplane." Ah, oh, that's so nice. I wonder if they'll have that. You know that. Red, red Hot Chili Peppers song, or, or the Red Hots, if, as Flea prefers. <laughs> I just finished watching Everybody's in L.A. I, I can't recommend it to most people because I think most people won't have the patience for it, but I'm, I'm glad I watched it. Anyway, I'm also glad that, Jamie, that you were able to join me on this late Sunday night 
to. Yeah, I'm glad I got to be here. This was this was fun. I look forward to our our meeting next week where we cover these these shows. They're so much fun. And I think we'll and hopefully we'll get it done in maybe almost half the time. We'll see. You bet. <laughs> you, you bet. You betcha. <laughs> anyway, thanks for listening and bye-bye. Bye. Mm-hmm.